the Facebook page, which is so exciting. And I have a chance each week to interview some top players. As you can see right now, I have got with me Chris Adler. Chris, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for uh, allowing me to, to kind of reach out to everybody that's checking this out and uh, be a part of this whole whole thing. It's so great, Chris, because we have the chance, you know, with technology today, and of course, with the challenges that we have with this crazy virus that's going on, you know, the seclusion and, and the lockdown of where we are, we're able to kind of reach people in their home as opposed to the insane traveling that I know that I go through and for sure that you go through around the world, which is absolutely insane. It is. And it's been, uh, you know, it's been a very interesting, I was thinking about it uh, today on my way uh, back here to, to speak with you uh, about how much of the time that I and people like yourself spend on the road. So when, I don't know about you, but when I come home from the road, whether it's been six, eight months of the year or whatever, it's normally like a bank vault closes and <laughs> I'm not quarantining myself necessarily from anything else, but it's like, okay, now, like I really have to dedicate myself to my home, my family, my kids, uh, all that stuff. And, and this has actually brought that about for me in an extended period of time, which in an odd way is considerably enjoyable because of the amount of time that I feel like I miss spending time out. And I realize that's not the case for most people. It's it's kind of the opposite where you know, even your home, your trip to uh, uh, <clears throat> Target or McDonald's, you know, gives you a time out, slight time out you know, from the family. So I, I certainly understand how, and now I'm getting to the point, certainly after this amount of time of, of being feeling a little cooped up, but it's been, it's been good uh, actually in my uh, kind of mental state to be here. And I, we've got three kids and uh, we just bought a new house. And so it's, it's been a, a great opportunity for me to really focus on the kids, uh, my fiance and the house itself. So it's, you know, I, I, I'm not one to complain. And I actually had a couple things go on right before this that kind of quelled my, uh, my personality of, you know, I really love to travel. I really, really do. Now, when you're with a band and you travel every single day, it's difficult. But I love the idea of going to new places, doing new things. Uh, doing it on my own. A lot of times when we go out as a band, I would spend the time uh, on my own to go visit local uh, things to see. Uh, my big thing was always going to different churches, nice. especially across Europe and seeing not, I, I'm not saying that's a, in a religious way. I was really interested in the architecture and those kinds of things. It's just beautiful buildings and stuff like that. So uh, just kind of getting out of it now, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, uh, I'm ready to get back out there. But uh, fortunately for me, uh, my fiance works and she works very hard. Uh, I've done a, a pretty good job of saving what I can. Uh, so, you know, we're not struggling through this, but I know a lot of people are. And yeah, so sure. I, don't, I, don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to have this be like, oh, you know, I've got something. I, I certainly understand it. And I understand it maybe more than uh, I can say, but maybe by uh, my actions, I can, I can tell you a little bit about it. So during this downtime where there are kind of no businesses open and all that stuff, there are certain places open. And they are called essential stores. Yeah. And so I found myself in a position. Uh, so I volunteer uh, in many ways. And one of the things that I volunteered for for, for a long time was uh, humanity. Uh, <clears throat> I just totally lost it. Uh, Habitat for Humanity. Oh, nice. Yeah. And the SPCA for animals. Yeah. Uh, but what I realized that Habitat for Humanity, when I was working there, and I wouldn't say working, I wasn't getting paid, but doing, you know, the service, yeah. Service, yeah. I realized that most of that stuff came from Home Depot. Yeah. And so I actually got a kind of a inward job with Home Depot helping Habitat for Humanity. So every day, 
uh, I am, it's, it's called an essential job. So I get to put on my mask yeah. and I get to go to work for five hours a day and, uh, help put people together and help make people that are really, really suffering, uh, through this whole thing, give them some hope through this whole thing. And it, you know, it, it, it feels good uh, to do that. I've also, of course, spent a lot of time playing music. <laughs> but that's fantastic, Chris. And that's that was a program that Jimmy Carter, one of our ex presidents, put together and started that. And they have done incredible things to giving hope to families and building homes for thousands of families. That's what we're doing, man. I'm I'm loading up lumber on trucks with forklifts every day. I'm I'm out there hammering nails. Like it is a very kind of rewarding thing you know my dad taught me that uh when i was a kid he uh he realized that myself and my two brothers needed to be in sports uh so he decided to contact the county and tell them that he was a uh, soccer coach <laughs> which he was definitely not <laughs> uh but he he brought in a lot of kids that you know needed you know i, I wouldn't in any way call it discipline but some some guidance and, and stuff like that and you know i i love the idea of whether this thing had been going on or not i was already volunteering at uh habitat and at spca so and we've got a couple of rescue pets here which you know it, it's amazing so well that's, that's great that's kind of my thing but now I, and, and now it's it the struggle has been for me is is trying to find drums what i was talking about earlier i found a couple of opportunities uh, right before this thing cracked open. November, I spent the whole month of last November in India doing a clinic tour hmm. uh, and had one of the best times of my life. I was able to bring my fiance with me and meet the, the people there. And this was my sixth time there. Wow. And I actually got, we went to one place. Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful place called Shillong uh, where we went there and, and the mayor of the town gave me a slight award. I was there with Megadeth at the time, yeah. uh, which is obviously a well-known, well-established, well-traveled project. Huge. Uh, but the, the, the crowd was uh, jumping up and down saying, you know, Adler, Adler. And I couldn't believe it. And the mayor came and gave me, he's like, you, you own the record of the, the Westerner that has ever come here the most. <laughs> and you know that I I'm, I'm very fortunate to have you know, a Grammy Award and a Canadian Grammy Award, but that that one is first out of the three. That uh, that was really special to me, and you know I have, we can talk about it. But I have uh, several projects going on. One of them actually was during that clinic. I met one of the best vocalists uh, I've ever heard in my life. Uh, and so we kept in touch, obviously he's, he's sung for the kind of after party, uh, or concert band, uh, that was going on after the clinic or in several cases, just a concert with, you know, with me. Yeah. And this guy is just, I've never heard anybody like him. I'm really excited to be working with him really. And during this time, creating those connections with, you know, of course I've dealt come into contact and, and reached out to old friends yeah. and been like, Hey, you know, how you guys doing? Like everything going okay. And for the most part, everybody's doing okay. But it's, it's really also given me a time to reach out to other musicians around the world and, and look for, you know, opportunities to create yeah. something yeah. in this kind of void of, we can't really meet up. We can't really practice, <laughs> and, you know? So, these kinds of conversations that have led me quite a long way as has vacuuming the kitchen that seems to work really well for, <laughs> for my fiance uh, doing that is almost as rewarding in, in the end in the end <laughs> hey, from loading two by fours onto a onto a truck and vacuuming well, you're really you're really down to a level of humility which is really really admirable it really really is that's fantastic hey, I'm getting around. It's all right. <laughs> so, what is it now that you're home and, and, and you're here? Are you are you listening to any different type of music? Are you going back to hearing old music? Are you are you are you practicing? What are you doing for yourself musically? I am initially uh, when everything 
when I came back from the clinic tour there. And then I got really lucky right before, I mean, on the blister of this thing blowing open, I got invited to go to Toronto with uh, Sam Dunn, who has done just all of the great kind of hard rock, heavy metal, yeah. uh, <laughs> real muso kind of documentaries uh, to film a TV show there, uh, which will be coming out soon. Um, that was in January. And we, when we came into the airport, coming back from that, it was a little tense. It was like, everybody's being like, you know, forehead tested for a fever and all wow. that stuff. Yeah. Luckily myself and my fiance uh, dealt with that. We, you know, we got through it. Um, but kind of going forward, it's, it's, it's been a struggle, you know, to really kind of work out of the house. But again, um, it's, it's always been my dream to work out of the house. Like, <laughs> I remember years ago, I was talking to my daughter and I, I said, you know, she's like, why do you have to leave all the time? And you know, that broke my heart yeah. for real. It really did. Um, and I was like, well, they can't come to us. Mm. And this thing has kind of created the point that actually, you know, we are the same as at home as we are on stage. And if we can create this digital connect, um, I, I love interacting. And it's, it's been a, a big thing of, I, I'm not saying that I'm a very social guy. In fact, I'm quite the introvert, but I love the idea of being able to connect with people and not for, I don't want praise or anything like that, but mm -hmm. to talk about ideas, to work through this or that, um, whether it be drums or just, I'm having a hard day kind of stuff yeah. with my friends. Yeah. Um, it, it's really been a great opportunity because I have friends now all over the world, which is a blessing. Uh, and they've, you know, one of them, uh, my friend Doug in Australia, you know, he literally saved my life uh, at, at a real downtime in my life. And you're very familiar with probably another really good buddy of mine. Uh, his name's Bob Terry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he worked at Mapex. Um, for a long time. He took Great over guy. Joe, Joe Hibbs' job. Great guy. And, guy. You know, I almost left, not, I don't, I don't want to be negative about anything Mapex because it's always been a consistent and dedicated product. But I almost left Mapex because when I first got my first endorsement deal, it was with Premier Drums from a guy named Joe Hibbs. Yes. Joe Hibbs got fired from Premier Drums and went to Mapex. Very and, different idea. And I, somehow in in the middle of that not in a weird way but joe and i became and and joe was you know 60 years old at the time yeah uh, joe and i became best friends we'd go out for food we you know have a drink do all this stuff and, and i loved him and so when joe in a really unfortunate way passed away he he really was my best friend at the company and, and bob came in and i know part of this conversation needs to should be about Mapex drums because I, I do believe in them and have believed in them, but it's been because of Bob Terry and Joe Hibbs. Yeah, yeah. And the, unfortunately, uh, Joe's gone. And from what I hear the other day, uh, Bob's been let go from the company. So I'm a bit adrift at this point, but I, you know, we are kind of trying to find families in weird ways at this time. Yeah, but you know something, Chris. I think what's amazing about it is, and and Bob is a very talented player himself too, which is, is. A, aside from being yeah. a, a great uh, you know A and R person. I think what's happening is all many many companies because of the challenging time we're in have had to let people go and have had to move and readjust their business. But I have a feeling in time as we get back to the action of of how it used to be, where companies can get back in, I think we'll start to bring back a, a healthier plan of what's going to happen with all the different companies that are experiencing the same challenges. Yeah, of course. No, I just wanted to give a little shout out to Bob. Yeah. Uh, just because he, he really saved my relationship uh, with Apex. And I mean, Joe, Joe really was, uh, I know your viewers don't want to hear this, but Joe <laughs> was my rep there and he was my best friend. And, you know, he called me every Sunday and asked how the cat was doing kind of, <laughs> kind of thing. It wasn't just like, Oh, you need this drum. It was like we were friends. We yeah, every yeah. time we met up, he came over for Thanksgiving. 
you know, so, so it was so sad to lose him. And it's, it's really sad for me to lose Bob because Bob actually found his way into my heart into taking his place. And I think we both respected Joe very much. So it, it, it's not, I don't need you to <clears throat> tell me that Mapex is going to be okay. Yeah, I, I'm sure they are. Yeah, yeah, but I, th I think the key thing is the fact that that um, and I knew Joe Hibbs very, very well. Joe, I, I met Joe back in the early days when he was still living in Houston, Texas, working at a at a at a drum shop, and then uh, got his first job over at Tama Drums back in the early '80s. And and oh, yeah. and you're right, people make up the companies. It's the people make up the companies, and that's a very, very strong part of it. And it's these people that have the vision of even where the future of where the drums go. I mean, like, you know, just with the design of, I, I interviewed Russ Miller a few weeks ago, and Russ was talking about his designing of the design lab and where the new Saturns are coming out. So, you know, companies, you know, it's people behind these companies that produce great product and make things happen. It really is amazing. It is. And I know Russ, and he, obviously, if anyone doesn't, check him out. The guy's absolute drum genius. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I have no doubt you know, Maybex is going to, you know, continue to do top of the line stuff. But, you know, for the young artists that are, you know, kind of starting out looking for endorsements, this is not to say that there's not somebody at Maybex because there's going to be a great guy. If uh, when Joe passed, when Bob took it over, you know, Bob's gone, there's going to be somebody there that's going to be great. Yeah. Um, and, and I am not discouraging that, but like you said, every drum company in the world makes great products. Mm. I believed in Maybex because I actually believed the uh, inclusion of walnut wood in or very early on before anybody else was doing it was a genius move. Yeah. And I loved it. And you can hear it on all of my albums. Um, so to kind of move forward, you know, <laughs> I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing kind of where it goes, but there is certainly a lot of hope in the industry, but it is tough right now. And I think, you know, this as well as I do, we're doing calls like this because we can't meet up and, and do it together. And yeah. it's just a tough time. It's kind of crazy, but what, 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 in the craziness of this time, you know, I've got comments of people that are coming on, signing on from all around the world. You have got an incredible fan base of people that really love you, man. They, they, they love you as a person. They love your playing. I mean, they're just people, you know, all over the place. You know, Miles Chen and Bob Terry says hello and love your brother. I mean, so many people that are all around the world. It's really incredible what you have built. And we had performed it together at the La Rioja Drum Festival several years ago. And I heard you play and it was just, you played so great and so clean and so with so much energy. And you've always played that way. Even some of the clinics I've heard you even before that time. What drives you? What motivates you? Wow. Well, that's a multifaceted uh, <clears throat> bunch of information there. <laughs> uh, thank you to everyone and anyone that might tune in and say hi. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, I've never really been good with the accolades of this whole thing. When I, when I got my first Grammy, I gave it to my mom. When I got my second Grammy, I gave it to my mom. Um, this is, I, I, I believe that we all have, you know, an ability, a natural talent. I'm not going to get religious, but I, you know, we all, we're all good at something. And sometimes yeah. we all find the wrong things to end up doing. Uh, and I was not a drummer because I was pursuing IT until I was 21. Wow. So then I found out, oh, I love these bands in Richmond. And you know what? I want to I wanna get a drum kit and just practice in my room. And I had the very best time of my life doing it. <laughs> so going, going forward, um, you know, what, what drives me, what makes me, I think the thing that has always been a part of my life, and I, I will give my father the greatest credit for this. So when I turned 14, uh, he said, You're, we're going down right now to City Hall or whatever it was in that county. And he said, we're getting a worker's permit and you're going to work 
tomorrow. <laughs> and so I worked at Wendy's. I worked at McDonald's. I worked at Subway. And these places were obviously not where I'm supposed to be. But it gave me this concept of this. If I can get over this hurdle, you know, I'll, if I can prove that maybe I shouldn't be working at McDonald's, <laughs> Um, you know, we can go somewhere else with this. And I kept doing that. I kept doing that. And I kept doing that. Sometimes that's a curse because there's never a hurdle high enough. There's never a time where you, you know, put your hands under your head and bed and be like, ah, nailed it. And I don't, I've never had that satisfaction. So I think the thing that keeps me kind of moving forward is the idea of that bar that I just jumped over, even though it was really, really high, yeah. uh, you know, two years ago, it wasn't high enough. <laughs> and I, I'm just not willing to, to kind of give up on the idea of, of pushing forward. And that's, I don't mean to sound, what we, especially what I have done uh, as a musician is, is very hardcore, very limited audience, very difficult, um, unattainable <laughs> to most people. Yeah. Um, but I did it really well. And I think that's probably why we're talking. Uh, that's not necessarily what my interest was uh, going into it. I wanted to learn how to play drums. Yeah. And what pushed me the most was that we had a, the, I think one of the best guitar players in the country Mark Morton yeah. come in to my back room uh, in a in a little shack in Richmond that I was renting with no heat, <laughs> and he he made me want to play for at least ten hours before he showed up again because he embarrassed me every time he came in, and I was like, dude, I got to show him something. I yeah. got to you know kind of keep moving up. And now a lot of people would say like, well, you know, you, you did it, you made it. And to me, I appreciate the, there's no way I would, uh, as a 14 year old where this dream began or 12 year old as this dream began, uh, believe that I'd be here with, you know, the, the ability to have a family playing music uh, I couldn't believe it because I, I went into IT for a very, very long time and, and did very well with that. And and now it's like, well, to some extent, as you know, I left the band. Yeah. And this is not about. Uh, actually, I thought the greatest hurdle at that time the greatest hurdle that I could overcome was leaving that band mm. and starting something else. Yeah. And that is not to say that, you know, my dream from the beginning hasn't been entirely fulfilled. I couldn't imagine yeah. this actually happening. We were just struggling to, you know, he, I'll tell you a story. We used to drive to, uh, in our early days, we had a van, we drive to trailer parks or state parks and park there. And on the way there, after a basement show where, where there was no money and no nothing other than spaghetti, we would put cans of soup on the engine so that when we got to the park, and even though we didn't have a tent, we could sleep in the van with maybe a little hot food. Oh so it, it, it has been a long time, you know, since there's been any question in my mind of where we are going. Yeah. And that question came about. So now I'm uh, focusing this unfortunate virus uh, is in a weird way, very kind of timely for me because I'm focusing on my family. I'm focusing on my home. Uh, my mother passed in November. So I'm focusing on, you know, dealing with that. Oh boy, state sorry. And, and think, thank you, uh, things like that. But I'm also, ready to raise the bar in a different way. And I think mm -hmm. the question you asked was, you know, what keeps you going? It, it has to be, better is not the right word. 
because there is no, that's, that's an incredibly subjective opinion. Um, it has to be different and substantial in my mind to what has happened before. And I'm, I'm really lucky to have some guys working with me right now. And again, very distant. There's, you know, I almost wore a mask for the interview uh, <laughs> just because you were on the other end. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to, you know, to, to move forward right now for me is going to be about, you know, really focusing, respecting my family, which I've, I've in many ways not been able to do on tour for, for so long. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I'm not the youngest guy on the block. I, I see these kids playing circles around me. It's, it's no joke uh, to this whole thing. I had a friend. Um, so I was telling you about this show in Canada that I went up and played. Uh, I didn't play. Uh, I was a I was a judge on a team of judges of these guys uh, playing drums it, in Canada. It's a show called Shredders of Metal that Sam Dunn is doing, and it was a yeah. fantastic experience because I got to see kind of this new generation of players, and I was really inspired by that. Um, if anybody's watching, check out Derek uh, from Shredders of Metal. Uh, I we've become, you know, friends and, and talking about things. But right now, I think it is really just a time to not, I understand the people with flags saying like, I don't want to wear a mask. It's like, you know what? If you don't want to wear a mask and you want to walk around with a flag saying you shouldn't be doing it, it's probably because you should get a divorce. Like, go, home, go home and love on those people that have missed you every day or every month or every week that you have been kind of gone. Yeah. And if those people don't want you there, well, that's a good source of information that maybe shouldn't be there. <laughs> great point. Great, great point. Well, you know, listen, with, with, with you losing your mom, your mom was able to see you play at incredible events. She had the Grammys. I mean, she was able to witness this journey that could only have been a dream. And in family, when that happens, you really were able to show her that you could do it and you did it. That's huge. It really is huge. It was, um, you know, the, the awards themselves didn't uh, strike me as much as they did her because, you know, some of those awards are, you know, based on Elvis. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's been a time ago since the whole system got reset. And especially in the metal category. Uh, now even hard rock and metal has gotten lumped together. It's not a comfortable place for metal musicians to kind of exist. Because yeah. there, there are albums, like even in my world, where I would study what everybody else is doing, like, oh, man, that is, that is so great. And the things that made me want to do what I do came yeah. from my listening habits of when I was a kid. Yeah. So it, is, um, it, it, it was absolutely very special for her and for my dad mm -hmm. um, to kind of see these things and th those weren't things when i set out you know we, we we set out together in the dorms uh myself the guitar player the bass player to just kind of make some noise and, and be as ugly and aggressive as we could because <laughs> at, the, at the time uh hard rock and, and metal were really just not being uh listened to by um major labels even metallica went in a strange direction during yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so we just focused on like, hey, if we can get free beer at a basement party and play this shit, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> and, and it caught on again. We weren't the first ones. It wasn't, you know, Metallica did the same thing. Megadeth did the same thing. I was very lucky to play with Megadeth for two years. And yes. write an album that gave me the Grammy. It was an amazing <laughs> experience. It was my favorite band forever when I was a kid. But go, going like forward, it's like, well, all right. You know, here we are. Let's let's redefine it again. I've, I've told my daughter, who does not like my music, 
uh, whatsoever. She calls it boy music. Uh, I told her, I said, you know, well, that's good because it's probably going to fade out here pretty quick because music really kind of comes around same way fashion does. Yeah, yeah. But give it 20 years and when I'm too old to even understand what you're telling me, you're going to say, hey, dad, do you know the biggest band on the planet now just referenced you? <laughs> it's kind of that thing. So. Well, it's kind of interesting because you know they, they use terms like groove metal or thrash metal or progressive metal. There are all these different areas that describe it. Where, where would you describe what you do? Is it all, all the above or, or have you narrowed it down? I guess the biggest problem that I've had, and I think a lot of um, like purists, well, I don't, uh, opposite of purists, yeah. uh, fans of hard rock run into is this segregation of all these different terms. Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually love the idea uh, that somebody would call it groove metal because there is no groove without a drummer. And yeah. I love the idea that somebody's calling me groovy. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. Um, and there are certainly bands that did that before, but I th it was an evolution out of thrash metal that led to this, you know, it came from the Metallica, uh, Megadeth. Uh, when it went into Pantera, when it, when it had Vinnie Paul doing something really very different than what Dave Lombardo was doing, which was just, you know, and I love Dave, we know each other, I'm not giving him shit, but yeah. Dave was like, I, I can do this faster than you can. And Vinnie was like, I'm gonna make your ass move. <laughs> that, that was, to me, that was kind of like, okay, like it, I'm not picking either. I just want to speed up the ass movement. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. And uh, Vinny, what a special person Vinny was. What an incredible guy. <laughs> man, I had an incredible opportunity because I was close with him. And I was, I met Dime several times, but I became close with Vinny. And, I, and they asked me to speak at his funeral, mm. which was, it was kind of the, uh, <clears throat> To be honest with you guys, like that was the moment that I realized, like, I'm an adult. Yeah. Like this whole rock and roll experience uh, that I've had has been almost a fantasy because my hero, my friend, uh, is dead, and I am asked by everyone close to him to to please speak about him at his funeral, and that was, I was not without words i was ready to go mm. uh but it was a very difficult thing to accept because i had to, to kind of eat it and that was one of the moments in my life where i realized like fuck, like i'm an adult now like people are dying at my age people are dying very close to my age like this is happening and i know Vinny, and we all know stories of Vinny. yeah you know, he, he uh probably didn't eat his greens every morning. He pushed but the envelope, yeah. I wish he had, yeah. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, if he did, you know, it, it may not have been the same. So, you know, I love him as a person. I also love the legacy and, and uh, you know, he, he loved me too. And it was, a, it was a sad moment, but I was very proud to be a part of that. Boy, the, 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 there were so, so many drummers that, that um, and I, I think I, I want to go, go by some names here. I think some people that were, that you were interested in or might have influenced you. People like Shannon Larkin, Stuart Copeland, Bonham, Dave Lombardo, Gar Samuelson, Lars Ulrich, Billy Cobham, Gene Hoagland. They seem to be like, these are people that have, have uh, that you've, I think, been influenced by, right? Absolutely. And I think the, the two that maybe uh, should stand out in this conversation, because I think you could talk to any other heavy metal drummer and find a, a similar list, except for Billy Cobham and Stuart Cobham. Yeah. yeah. Everyone else on that list, established metal artists yeah. that kind of made their way through this strange industry of, of heavy metal. Uh, if I were to give props to anybody on, on that, 
of course, it's Lars who defined the really. Yeah. I'm not going to say he defined the genre, but he defined the sound. Yeah. And yeah. he made it global. Like he put it on the map. He, he, undeniable. He, he, he now, put it on the global map. Exactly right. Yeah. At the next, uh, out of those, the guy that actually taught me more than I could ever thank him for is Gene Hoblin, who's probably the greatest yeah. heavy metal drummer I've ever heard in my life. And yeah. I had a conversation with Gene about it. We were friends. And I, I told him, I was like, you know, what you've done is just remarkable. I, I, I don't even understand the jazz parts of what you're doing because heavy metal has always been zeros and ones, very binary. Yeah. I'm not sure. Like, how do I how do I begin to understand what you're doing? And he told me, and I I loved hearing it, and I, I use this example all the time when I'm having conversations with people about metal drumming. The thing that helps Gene stand apart, the thing that helps me stand apart a little bit, is because, like you said in your earlier list, I'm listening to Stuart Copeland. Right. When Gene was a kid. He took drum lessons to be a funk drum player. Right, yeah. And in the end, he just sped all that stuff up. <laughs> and it was like mind blowing <laughs> in the genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I couldn't be a bigger fan. He's, and Gene has an educational series out, Atomic Clock, which is fantastic in how he explains oh. this stuff. And plays, and he plays open-handed. He's a lefty that plays. Now you're there, also a lefty, correct? There's, yeah, I am actually left-handed. I learned. <laughs> this is a funny story. Yeah. I learned how to play drums. Um, <laughs> so I played guitar and bass in several bands uh, that I was coming up with as a kid, and when the the guys would go like for a break. I'd always jump behind the drum kit and, and you know play for a little bit. And so when I decided after my high school band broke up, after my college band broke up, I decided, hey, you know what? I'd love to get a drum kit. I'm gonna play, and let's kind of see where it goes. I don't have any intention other than it was always fun to drum, jump behind these guys' kits. So yeah. I learned even as as a left-hander, I just set up my kit the same exact way that every band that I'd been in had been in. And I was, you know, not to say that I'm any smarter now, but I was dumb enough at the time to not realize I could set it up the other way being like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's kind of been my thing, but there is, and this has come up many, many times uh, in my playing uh, from uh, all the albums, a lot of the comments that I get from other players, a lot of the comments I get from interviews, um, especially, you know, kind of drum aficionado kind of stuff is, you know, well, how, how did that happen? And it's always because I'm left-handed and I just lead in a different way. I lead with my left foot. I lead with, with my right hand, but I still have it set up that way. Yeah, so there's yeah. always this weird triplets here and there to make sure I end up in the right place to get back to something else. But, you know, it was interesting because even, you know, Ringo Starr, who was a natural lefty, yeah. who played on a right-handed kit, the same thing. When I was young and we heard Ringo in the early, in, in the 60s, and the band was playing, we tried to analyze what he was doing. He started all of his fills with his left hand, and it sounded a little bit different. And you have that same kind of sound, but you put this into the metal world where you've got this intense, you know, you know in-your-face sound but some of the stickings in what you do really are interesting. You just do it naturally. It the is, rest, it, it, yeah. there's, there's no effort. I mean, I'm I'm not trying to boast, but there's no yeah. effort in that because it, it is naturally yeah, yeah. my tendency to do it. And one of the things that you know, one of our producers said to me a long time ago, he's like, um, "There's something you're doing in one of these songs that is uh, just weird." And I, let's talk about it. I was like, "Okay, what is that?" He's like, well, you're coming up from the low tom to the high tom. Um, and, you know, that's that, that people don't recognize that. Like, what is that? <laughs> I was like, well, it just makes a lot more sense for me to that way than it goes the other way. It's, it's a lot harder for me. And I wasn't even thinking exactly what you're thinking, this left, right hand. Yeah. Thing. So that became like his 
thing. And this guy's named Josh Wilbur and he's my best friend. Um, but what happened was we kind of use that all the time. <laughs> he's like, this is not like every other band I record. They don't, <laughs> they can't even do it. <laughs> and he's like, you can do both sides. And because you, I've spent so much time, you know, playing covers or trying to figure out this or that, but like, nobody can really do it the way that you're doing it. Like, really? this is really special. Uh, so I just kind of, I didn't focus on that, but I realized there was something different about what I was doing because of the way that I was dumb enough to set up my kid. But that's interesting. And that, if Stuart Copeland and Billy Cobham, who I, I I know both of them, many times they'll play patterns starting with their left hand, even though they are naturally righty. So they put themselves into the position of doing that, that they started with their left hand in, in different areas. And just that level of creativity for you, you listen, you got the best of both worlds. You're playing a righty kit and you're a natural lefty. That really is an incredible advantage to a high level, especially in playing metal music where you need the full scope of your instrument to right. get around you know, 180, which is what you're playing. It is. It, it's a spaceship. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I try to navigate it as well as I can. I think one of the things that people have pointed out a lot is the uh, my use of splash symbols and little effects yeah. and, and bells and stuff like that. And I'm not trying to be, you know, the extravagant guy in, in the genre and, and doing all this stuff. I actually learned that from <laughs> this is like a 80s don't do drugs commercial. I learned that from watching Gene Holland. Oh uh, man. Where he's got, you know, two hands going all the time with the bells and, you know, kind of splashes all over the place. So um but you also I, you also have incredible feet too. So you take the your hand facility and yet you, you complement that with your feet much like Gene. I mean, my gosh, you guys really have an incredible intensity and power and an endurance that that's physically really really intense. That's one of the things that uh, during this, I was telling you earlier about this uh, television show that I went up and filmed in Toronto, which I was so excited to do it because I was uh, ended up being a judge in the show, as I said. But it was a it was a competition of it was very much like American Idol, but it was metal drummers, and it was like, oh, okay, like this is great. I was like, you know, let me kind of figure this out get in the headspace of kind of where everybody's coming from and, and work through that. And man, these guys blew me away. So <laughs> I don't, I don't feel like I, after seeing that, after being a part of that, after judging that, I have very little <laughs> hope for myself <laughs> because there, there, there's this new generation, Dom, and I know you're, you're one step removed from it in a way. Yeah. But there, there is, this new generation uh, coming up where it's like, what the hell yeah, did you yeah. have for breakfast? Because yeah. I couldn't do that if my life depended on it, if there was a gun at my wife's head. Like, what is going on with this whole thing? And I'm not a fan of, I'm really not. One of the things I say in my clinic all the time in my clinics, just because you can do it doesn't <laughs> mean you should do it. Right. 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 So right. my goal, like we talked about earlier, Benny Paul, who was far more proficient than what he was doing in the band, even though it's a struggle for me to even learn some of his bars because everyone's unique in a way. Yeah. Uh, but going forward, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. If I can, you know, 30 second drum notes at 300 BPM, that doesn't make a song better. You know, right. that, that doesn't do anything. It's a, a show off competition that kind of ends nowhere. Yeah. You might get a participation award, but yeah. you know, that's it. So I've always loved the idea you mentioned earlier of groove. I've always loved the idea of not, I've done some certainly and been involved with some definitively abrasive heavy metal but even on the early stuff that i was doing where i was kind of 21 and uh wanting to just piss off everybody's parents <laughs> there's there's still something in there that 
was you could you understood the rhythm to it there was something about it that kind of made it happen and that's been my focus the whole time especially with lamb of god <laughs> it was to take these riffs and of course these guys are incredibly talented uh players coming in but to find something a little bit different instead of the the standard you know um just da 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 yeah, you can do that at home with your drum machine. Yeah. Like, what what am I going to do to it? Am right. I, how, in my mind, I would always go home with those little rehearsal tapes that I would make and think about, well, if this thing is in four, I think as long as they're cool at turning around at 12, I want to play a drum beat in three. <laughs> and that was always the case. Uh, and, and they would kill me for it. It's like, what are you hearing? What the hell are you talking about? But that actually made the band, um, I think it, it really made us stand out. Oh, is it? And I, I've heard that. I'm not dictating that. I, I've heard that from many people. So. Oh, wait, we, I get that from all, all, of, all of the people that listen to you play. They, they, they really hear a defined personality coming from you that allows you to think differently and project that into the music. That really is that really is very special. You know, here's a comment from a, a gentleman in the UK from Felipe Drago. He said it was amazing seeing Chris playing with Lamb of God and Megadeth back to back in the same concert, where I believe you had two different kits that came out. Correct? Uh, I did. Um, that wasn't my choice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to give too much away, but. Megadeth wanted a specific performance in a specific way, so yeah. I did have a, uh, two different kits. And I did that tour uh, all across the UK and uh, other places as well, where we were both playing together and I did set after set. And looking back on it, that is actually, it was in the way that somebody would say, like, that has to be brutal or tiring or something like that. I was such a little kid. I was like, here's this band that <laughs> I helped create yeah. be in this same place that my very favorite band yeah. is going to play after. And guess what I get to do? <laughs> Jump off the seat and go play with them. Like It, it was the highlight uh, of my career. There's no awards that could take that away. It was something that I think back on very, very fondly. It was awesome. To be able to have that opportunity i don't think everybody else thought it was awesome in that kind of jealous girlfriend kind of way <laughs> it was great for me well i think there were many many drummers that really kind of enjoyed it let's talk about the drums for a moment here now you got some you've been with May mapex for a few years now and you've got some favorite drums with mapex is there a a certain sound that you look for so there is so i've been with mapex since 2004 when joe hibbs came in yeah and uh kind of talked me into coming to the factory and uh, hanging out with him. And since then, uh, as I told you earlier, we became good friends. Since then, you know, I guess my artist profile has risen to the point where Mapex said, hey, we'd like to do some sort of signature snare yeah. with you because you have this unusual snare sound. And I think a lot of the listeners to uh, our music, and one of the things that stands out, other than the great talent of everybody else in the band, uh, was my snare sound. And when I first started, I had a pearl kit with a piccolo snare. And they, everyone in the band, my nickname was Pinky, <laughs> which was, you know, obviously not flattering. But <laughs> my my snare sounded like pink, 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 pink. <laughs> Um, so that was my nickname in the band, but I love that idea of cutting through and it's a, it's a weird correlation, but there were, there were two bands and you mentioned one of them earlier, uh, Rap Child America on their earlier stuff with Shannon Larkin, who was probably yeah. my favorite drummer ever. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, a band that is off the path of, of anything that we've been talking about, a band called 311 that had this really high-pitched snare and i just really loved that sound and i really loved it and stuart copeland's playing as well with police in certain songs you could tell he was 
kind of you know, different snare here and there, but there were there were times where it was kind of really up there, and and maybe that was a tuning thing with whatever. But I, I was like, no, I want I want that all the time. I want that yeah. almost bird cry. It's same with the ride symbol that I developed with Mapex. It was like, this is Joey Kramer from Aerosmith when he hits the ride symbol, or Steve Smith from Journey when he hits yeah. the ride symbol. That thing takes over the mix. Like yeah. there's nothing stopping this snare from destroying everything you're doing. I don't care if you turn it up to eleven. <laughs> this is what I want to have happen. <laughs> and so I started working on this um, concept of a twelve-inch snare, which is typically a gospel uh side snare right yeah uh, and i started working on that concept with joe hibbs years and years ago and we put out actually it was maybex's first signature snare that could be right. uh, with the way that i wanted it and we've done now three since that because i guess other people are hearing it too but there's there's something to it man that um as a drummer and i and i think it all comes from the idea of when we were in the rehearsal space, especially in a young band, and I don't want to say young, but 20 something band, everybody's yeah. probably, you know, worked at, you know, carpool for long enough to get, you know, an enormous amp and everybody's on 11 the whole time. And now I can't hear my feet anymore. I can <laughs> barely hear the snare, even though it's in front of my face. Um, so this was really, even from the beginning, uh, out of like, how can I hear myself play when all this stuff is, is blasting at me? And what do I want to hear when I do? And that's that's how Mavex and I came up with this concept. And it, it includes, you know, again. You have the snare there? <laughs> yeah, I do actually. It is, I don't want to call it a museum piece, but it will be. Absolutely. At Beautiful. some point. Beautiful. It, it, it is. Uh, Walnut wood uh, engraved by laser uh, with some graphics that I came up with of an eagle, which is that my my last name is Adler, German interpretation or American English interpretation is eagle. Yeah. And uh, so we did that with my birth date and uh, some Latin words that mean you know dedication, uh, and it's been an incredible weapon in my uh performances it, uh, and in your in your drum set arsenal that's for sure is what it is that's it, that's it. It and terrible. interestingly enough so when i when I was a kid when i first when i put my first drum kit together i could not find that snare sound that i wanted which mm -hmm. was that like really kind of piercing ping ping sound where it's like you I think a lot of people, and this is maybe another tool where I was talking about earlier, where I think of things in six all the time. Another thing that I may be different about me is that I don't uh, find, if you are uh, in a dance club or whatever, I don't find the bass drum to be the point where I would move my ass. I find the snare drum to be where the the point where I would move my ass. Yeah. So I I wanted to compete with, I didn't want to compete, but I, I wanted to offer something that was very, very consistent with the idea of the snare, of course, the snare and the bass drum, that's it. Like there's fills and everybody can talk about that. But the song goes like this and the snare's on top or the kick is on the bottom. And I wanted to kind of challenge that a little bit where it's like, actually the most important thing is the snare. And it hasn't really been that way for a long time. So I created a sound that was kind of really undeniable. And I played in that way where the snare led all the time. And that created a lot of arguments in the writing process uh, with the guitar players because it's like, no, it's kick first. And it's like, no, it's it's snare first. Interesting. So it's a different way of thinking about it. But to me, that's kind of, uh, blame my parents. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, your sound is always great. You, you, your, your, drive, your bass drum sound always sounds deep and in the pocket. Your snare drum sound always cuts through no matter what, what's happening on stage. But then you get great tom mix. You get a great tom mix. I mean, it really is a, incredible how you have great ears to hear. You hear something like a songwriter. 
with, with like like the songwriter that you are. You hear that as a part of the arrangement, the orchestration. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm working on new songs, and I'm as you can see, probably behind me, got a keyboard here. I got a couple of guitars here. We're working on a project that does all this stuff. But you know, for me, it was always percussion wasn't a uh, just a blunt force object. Yeah, I didn't I didn't spend time tuning everything to to match, but mm. I certainly spent the time to make sure it was uh, noticeable, meaning like a, a tom tuning. Uh, what I would always use was the uh, Hampton races. Dun, 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 Right, 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 right. So there was a great differentiation between all of these things. And I think that kind of, again, especially with doing up fills and weird things with my left hand first, I think it really definitely helped set me apart a little bit. And you know, the reason we're talking is not because I'm some sort of uh, Steven Spielberg of drums. It, it's these little things that kind of like I really focused on and did differently, even on accident at most times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that ended me up here, which, you know, people say like, well, how do I how do I get where you're going? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> have a couple happy accidents, you know, that. That's really kind of it. So I've been, I've been very, very fortunate, but it wasn't, uh, it was not something that I sat down when I was 13 and it was like, hey, okay, here's the plan. Play the wrong way. Tune it like Hamtown races. Get a piccolo snare. Work with Mayfair. I don't know. You know, nobody knows. But uh, I think I, you really did that. But you, you, you followed your instinct and your heart and 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 what you heard so you, that allowed that to be that chris adler personality in every tune you know it's interesting we got a question here from uh from brandon Koo, who is a wonderful drummer in singapore i, I know heard, brandon right i heard about I how chris, you you know okay how, how you recorded lamb of god sacrament album and recorded each individual drum part one by one to, to really isolate it was this true is this how you did that this is a very interesting uh story and uh we've got some inquire wants to know news going on here <laughs> so we during the sacrament album we had a producer that and um, there's some deities that that we put out that kind of talk about it we had a producer named machine who was outside of our world and i really pushed uh that we used him even though he had never done a metal record before I really wanted to step out of the metal world producers and get somebody that kind of had a more slightly more global view on music because metal can be very like confined mm. to what is right and what is wrong. And right. I didn't want this band to be kind of stuck in this underground world forever. Uh, not that I thought we had everything it took to be more than that, but <laughs> If there's any chance of that, why don't we get a producer from outside our world? So this guy named Machine, his name's Gene Freeman from, um, and he's done a bunch of clutch records. He's done, uh, I don't even wanna start. He, he is a well-established, really well-respected uh, producer. Mm -hmm. He comes in and he's like, okay, so what we want to do with the drums here, because your parts are so intricate. And even though we have, you know, now we were assigned to Epic, so we had a, a decent record budget. Uh, even though we have a state-of-the-art studio, we want to make sure that everything on the drum kit is isolated as possible, mm. which is, you know, in a, in a live recording, almost impossible. Mm. Because as soon as, you know, if you, if you were to hit something a little bit late, it's stuck under the... Um, Symbol mic stuck under the bass drum mic. It is what it is. Yeah. I was like, well, okay, that you know, it sounds good. Like my favorite record at the time was Injustice for All, which is uh everything's very kind of is what it is and there's yeah. no interference. Uh so what do we do to make that happen? Uh he said, Well, I have this crazy idea. Uh and I'm not sure that he invented it. I'm not sure that uh He's the only one that continues to do it. I'm pretty sure uh, this is going around. Um, I have a 
done it since. I, I, I did it again uh, two albums later with Josh. But the idea was, <clears throat> you know the songs. We've been in kind of uh, rehearsals for six weeks. We've recorded them on room mics. Everybody knows what they're going to play, OK? Here's how the song goes. So what I want you to do is put blankets over all of your cymbals and blankets on your bass drums. OK. Well, tell me why. So the idea is that now I have a hand performance. You can still play those bass drums. You can still play those cymbals. Yeah. But as I started to do this, I realized I don't have, like they're not recording the cymbals. They're not recording the bass drums. I can just do a hand performance yeah. on this. And then, okay, now take those blankets off. Now we're doing a cymbal performance. I was like, so we're, you're taking this song that's already been recorded uh, in the rehearsal room and making it absolutely the perfect picture of what you intend to do. Because we all have little imperfections. If I slam, yeah. you know, if, I, if I'm trying to hit the kick drum and the snare drum at the exact same time, there's always a bit of a flam there. Absolutely. But now this guy is coming in and saying like, no, Let's separate it out without using electronic drums, without using MIDI, you know, let's, we're using real audio. Let's just do like three takes on the whole drum kit where, you know, you can hit this, you can do that. So that was an incredible learning experience for me in recording. Uh, and as a player to kind of, I was initially very opposed to that. I was like, dude, you know, I can play this. Like, Come on. He's like, yeah, I know you can play it. The problem is recording it because it's all 300 miles an hour. <laughs> so it, if we can like separate this and this and this and that, we can put it back together just like you played it with extreme clarity. So I think that's what he's asking about. And that's how we did it. That is absolutely amazing. It really is incredible. Well, I tell you something, Chris, you have, you've got, such great stories you've got such great enthusiasm your passion for playing is always you always hold it right up front and it's clearly evident because of the of the depth of work that you have produced so far and what's exciting is about what you're going to be producing next coming up i really am excited to hear what you're going to put together because i know the way you are as a drummer composer songwriter you're going to really crank this thing up it's going to be a whole new new idea do you call me a storm writer <laughs> so, a storm writer, storm writer is one thing. Storm I like that. No, I, like that. Storm. I think that might maybe I'll name the band that. <laughs> storm writer. Now, well, so um, as I was talking about earlier, very earlier in the chat, you know, I, I've met some great people around the world in all my travels, mm -hmm. and on my latest travel to India, yeah, you know, I met a guy uh, that is just blew me away as yeah. a singer, and I've been during this downtime, you know, coordinating with other people and being able to play this electronic kit recording on this uh, little, it's, it's not much. I, I don't have, I didn't take the uh, minimal amount of money that I, I made so far and build a studio or anything like that. <laughs> I, you know, put it into, I can get this done with this and let's, let's look at what the family needs. But I've got a little thing here and we've been doing some stuff with some people all across the world on it and it is i could not be more thrilled about it so that is the next thing that i'm working on there's going to be an announcement about it soon we've really come together with something that i think is very very special and i'm looking forward to doing it and i'm i'm stoked to be a part of the team so well, thanks to mapex thanks to you dom oh man chris thank you so much man. it's a pleasure spending some time with you time flies by way too fast Tons of people from around the world, questions and comments, all in support, 100% support of you. This is really exciting what you've built. You are influencing and you are really a positive energy in the drumming community. And for that, on behalf of myself and Mapex, we thank you so much. Stay well for you and your family. And we look forward to getting you back on the road and coming by and hearing you play. Thanks so much. You all do the same. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>